far as. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you once again for this tremendous privilege of gathering together as family and the unity that you've provided in each one of our souls, Father, but also as a congregation so that we might fellowship together, break bread together, and enjoy this sweet time with you through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a privilege this is. Thank you, Father, for bringing us to this place. Our individual walks uh, mean something to you personally. Thank you for teaching us this truth, and thank you for giving us purpose. We do pray for those that can't be with us, and we pray most of all for those that are still lost, that they might be converted before it's too late. Father, we're most grateful and thankful for your son's work on the cross to cancel out that debt and to make an evening like this a reality for all of us. We just ask for your blessings on this evening's message. May it be edifying for our souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Again, the deceitfulness of sin, part 55. We are definitely coming out of the mine shaft at this point. Um, so just keep that sort of, you know, summary cap on and try to draw from uh, all the other lessons. I know there's a lot. I mean, 55 is a lot. Uh, I, don't, I didn't calculate the months, but it's been months and months at this point. Um, so uh, with that said, um, there's been a theme that's been coming from the the pulpit in the last few messages, uh, and it has everything to do with this, obedience. Uh, it's not a novel theme, not from this pulpit at all. It's been a theme that really has taken shape over the last few years, ever since the gospel reload, um, and that it really is an imperative. It's not formulaic. Um, if we obey, we know that there are blessings, but that is a short change of the whole scope of obedience as the Bible lays it out. And so we have this principle um, that's been recurring, and this is a bit of a summary. Obedience isn't just wrought with blessings, but it is an imperative, an absolute. It isn't optional for a believer. doesn't mean we're going to do that perfectly. doesn't mean... Uh, that in that sense where it's not an option to disobey because God knows we know better. So it's not that. I'm speaking the way John, the Apostle John, spoke and wrote of uh, in his first epistle. He just spoke absolute. He said, listen, if, this, if you're saved, this, this is going to be evidenced. If you're not, then it won't. And that's how I'm speaking. So in that sense, obedience isn't optional. For a believer, this is something Jesus plainly stated in John 14, 15, as we saw in 15, 8 to 14. I uh, hope you understand again that I'm using the same type of language as the Apostle Paul, or excuse me, Apostle John in his first epistle used. Um, and then here's the MIA slide. Hopefully it works. This is from Sunday. Remember this whole thing? We looked at John uh, 14, 15, and this is that sort of bi-directional viewpoint where you have love uh, and obedience, and uh, Jesus said, you know, the two if you wills, the, the sort of matching if you will statements. John 14, 15, uh, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, in other words. So if you abide in love, if, you're, if you love me, you will obey. And then he turned around shortly thereafter, basically, in John 15, 10, and said, if you keep my commandments, if you obey, then you will abide my love. And so what we can say, essentially, is this, and I tried to describe this um, on Sunday, that all of that, th both of these things, love and obedience, were and have been eternally perfected in the Godhead before mankind even came on earth before earth was, so to speak, before creation um, even, because it's part of eternal life. These aspects of uh, the divine one, uh, the Godhead, uh, the three persons of the Godhead, the relationship between them, uh, love, obedience, were always there. And obedience in a perfect, in a divine sense, is basically perfect. If you think about uh, strict Strictly speaking, obedience in the Godhead is something that 
is without question an absolute. And that's what we see in the life of Christ. He always did his Father's will. Uh, he was the God-man after all. And so that was just an extension of perfect obedience into humanity, down on earth, so to speak. But this existed and pre-existed all of us. That's how we have to start thinking about things like the sphere of God and eternal life. And uh, when we read passages like those we just noted in John, we realize that Jesus was speaking from within that sphere. If you love me, you're going to obey me. If you obey, you abide my love. Because that was his perspective. His perfect perspective was this is the way it is. So what we have there uh, is what I call interlocking promises from the very mouth of Jesus. I think one of the loose ends here that may uh, still be causing some of you to be confused is regarding eternal life. And I was thinking about another way to teach it. Maybe if I simply switch the words around for you, it'll click. So instead of saying eternal life, is it fair to say life eternal? Does that help? You're giving you're given life that is eternal. Life eternal. See, that changes everything, doesn't it? When you have eternal life, you think timeline immediately. Timeline. Oh, eternal. Finite mind goes into timeline mode and then applies life on top of it, right? If you turn them around, which is fair to do, life eternal, all of a sudden the focus now, the emphasis is on life first, which is appropriate. Remember, life originates with God. He being not only the source of all life, but also the embodiment of it. So that should help you. Maybe if you ever get stuck on eternal life, just turn them around. Say, life eternal. That's how you think about eternal life. It's about life. And it's described as eternal because it's always existed. But it's the life that's the focus. And life itself is in that sphere. That's it. Life is good. It's intrinsically good. So anything that's also intrinsically good is also attached to and authored by and intrinsic to life itself, life eternal. And so when Jesus spoke, that's how he spoke. He said, because I am eternal life. <laughs> it's, the only vantage, it's the only viewpoint I really have is this one because it predates all of this. So if I'm going to sanctify you, if I'm going to do this good work and, and, and save you and sanctify you, I want you to know what the end goal is. The end goal is to be with us in heaven, to have this life eternal, because you were born dead. So you might even think of it this way, life up here, death down here. So reflecting on that, death wasn't even an issue for we humans until the fall in the garden. Go to Genesis 2.16, Genesis 2.16. So that's what the Spirit's trying to say to us. That's what He's been trying to teach us. He says, if you really want to get a grasp of this relationship, this interlock between love and obedience, then just elevate your thinking into the entire sphere of God and realize that these things existed before humanity even did. And before the fall, we were all, all humans were in that sphere. Genesis 2.16, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. And that's the point of transition. So you think about uh, the garden before the fall. Adam and, Re Adam and Eve are in the middle there, experiencing life. They were alive. God made them alive. He said, you're with me. You get to experience my life, my fellowship, my love, you obey. Did they not obey? They did. Because that's what they wanted to do. That was, that was their, their notion. Their, that's what life does. When you're in this life, when you have life eternal, that's implied. They loved God even. But he said, if you disobey me, ah, in other words, if you, 
eject yourself from one of those things. I don't know why I snapped, but one of those things. <laughs> ah, I felt probably the right thing to do. So if you eject, <laughs> I don't know. So if you, if you eject yourself from obedience, right, you're out. Because now there's something impure in that sphere. And God won't have it because he's holy. And holy means completely separate for his own purposes. He says, if you disobey me, you're out. If all life is in here with me, when you eject yourself, when you choose to eject yourself, you're out. You've broken this thing that we have, this beautiful thing that I created you in. And so we think about it this way, the opposite of life. Death is the opposite of life. It is what God promised mankind in the event they ever disobeyed him. He just, we just read that. He promised it. He said, if you disobey me, you're going you're gonna to fracture what is perfect in me. And because of that, because I'm holy, you're out. So by its very nature, disobedience is a proclamation of ejection from the sphere of eternal life, namely from God. And we call that, in theological terms, spiritual death. But we also know spiritual death precipitated physical death. Dying thou shalt die. Mut to mut, right? And so, by its very nature, disobedience is a proclamation of ejection from the sphere of eternal life, namely from God, a.k.a. spiritual death. So, if we think in terms of this diagram, and I don't want you to get hung up on it, so I don't draw that much anymore. But if we do just for a moment as an aid, as a visual aid, at the fall, man chose, and that's the key word, he had a choice, man chose to eject himself from the sphere of God, from the very center of life itself, life that is described as life eternal, or eternal life. That was the choice. He, God told him, God didn't say, it's not going to, he actually said, if you, if you disobey me, you're going to die. Up here on the board. So a little bit more on death. Therefore, when man disobeyed God, he had to be ejected from this holy place called life. You got to think about it. God is eternal life. Jesus Christ is described as eternal life. So when man disobeyed God, he had to be ejected from this holy place because this holy place is pure. Or more specifically, eternal life or life eternal. Life and death are mutually exclusive. So with this perspective, this is why we cannot do the concept of eternal life, the injustice of whittling it down to facets that even an unbeliever can comprehend. So in other words, if I went up to an unbeliever right now and said, could you describe to me what eternal life would be in your own words? They'd probably say, yeah, it means you go on forever and ever. You live forever. I would argue most Christians feel and think the same thing. They don't even think about eternal life in other, in other terms. They don't think about life eternal. They think about eternal life. An unbeliever can do that. But what the Spirit's saying is, when you do that, you rob yourself of the experience of what Jesus was teaching. When you think about, if you love me, you'll, you'll keep my commandments, or vice versa. When you think about that, it doesn't conjure up eternal life. It conjures up formula. Because you're not, you're not ratcheted in the way Jesus was. And let's face it, the full intent of, of any writer, of any author, is to express him or herself, correct? The idea for us as a reader is to get what the author was saying, not what we think it should say. That's why I don't, part of me doesn't really like art, that aspect of art, but I don't want to get into it. We don't have that right. The idea with writing, especially in the Bible, is we want to get to the bottom of what the author was saying. And if we don't understand basics like eternal life, then when he talks plainly about, hey, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments and vice versa, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss the whole thing because we don't understand 
his vantage point, where he's speaking from. And that's the beauty. That's, that's the beauty of simplicity and clarity in context in the Bible. It's what I've been trying to teach you now for years. You read for context. You look for the, what the author is trying to say. Even if it's not Jesus, anybody. What are they saying? Okay, they said that, but what is it that they're saying? And what is it that they're most likely intending the reader uh, or their audience to hear, to understand? Again, this is why we cannot do the concept of eternal life, the injustice of whittling it down to facets that even unbelievers can comprehend. The truth is that eternal life transcends human timelines. Remember, I've taught you this many times. God is not bound to the construct of time. So if you're thinking that, there is no timeline with God necessarily. That's a construct he gave us for our puny minds. But eternal life predates that. So we can't box in something much grander into like a two-dimensional viewpoint. More on this up here on the board. Eternal life or, as a memory aid, life eternal. When we think of eternal life, we must think of it as an object, not just a description of a timeline with no beginning or no end. And we did look at 1 John 1, 2, 5, 11, 5, 20, etc. Um, we can't think of it, eternal life that way, and that's why I think it's easier to think of it in some ways as life eternal, because it starts with the concept of life. Again, that's all I was saying up here with this goofy slide. Yes, I had to do it twice because I worked so hard on it. It didn't come up on Sunday, so you get the... <laughs> Anyways... That's all I was trying to say there, is think of it this way, because this is the vantage point of our Lord. To Him, everything's implicit. It's implied. So the question that begs to be answered is one we pondered on Sunday. Why do you think Jesus wants us to know about the fullness of, say, obedience and love, or love and obedience, or anything in that sphere? Because there are other aspects, obviously, of the Godhead, that are in that sphere, like justice and righteousness and all that kind of stuff. Why does he want us to know these two things, though? obedience and love and love obedience, especially in the context or within the context of eternal life? Well, John answered that for us. Go to John 15, 11. John 15, 11. John answers it. This is why. Because something happens to a believer when they have these kinds of aha moments in their soul. When eternal life, and I had a member, actually multiple members of the congregation, one in particular was absolutely elated. And this is an individual that's been in the Word of God for decades. Never had, uh, the light bulb went off, they said, on eternal life itself. Imagine that. So something happens experientially when these light bulbs go off, when you actually understand what, eternal life means. Something happens, and John wrote about it. Well, John wrote it, but Jesus was saying it. These things I have spoken to you, so that. I want you to know all this stuff. I want you to know every last drop that's in that sphere right there. I want you to know everything about what it means to be in me, to be baptized into union with me, because I am eternal life. These things I've spoken to you so that my joy. And you see, my joy, if you were to, I could draw another bubble and put, my, and put joy in there too, and it would be appropriate. And if you have love, guess what you have? Another interlock with joy. If you have joy, you have love. If you have joy, you have obedience. If you have obedience, you have joy. You get it? I can throw anything in there. And they all interlock. That's the whole point, and that's the vantage point of the Godhead. And that's the vantage point of God who became man, Jesus Christ. So this is why he spoke this way. He said, I want you to know these things so that my joy, another aspect in that sphere right there, may be in you, and that your joy may be made full. In other words, I want you to spend all your time in there. He knew that we would, you know, eject ourselves experientially in and out of this sphere. Um, he knew that, but... 
his desire was that we shared his joy, that our joy would be made full, which would imply, frankly, full-time experience, as full as possible. Spend as much time as possible in here. That's what I want for you. That's why I have my spirit teach you these things so that you can have these aha moments, so that you can ratchet one notch forward, closer to me, sanctified, we might call it, one more step towards my viewpoint, which is eternal. The point is, though, that <laughs> somewhere between this perfect harmony that Jesus Christ wishes for his sheep and our experiences is a road littered with sin. Somewhere between this desire that we are reading here in Holy Scripture and uh, our life or our experiences is a road littered with sin. Our experiences in this life are as imperfect as we are. Our experiences in this life are as imperfect as we are. Half the battle nowadays is getting Christians to agree with this one simple truth even. I, mean, I guess it makes sense uh, given the fact that many churches nowadays preach a watered-down gospel. I mean, people aren't even... Um, people aren't even willing to make people stumble anymore. The gospel by its very nature is a stumbling block. Have you ever thought about that? It's not meant to be smoothed over. It's not like, it's not like a, a bar of wax that a surfer would use, right, and just wax things up so everybody can just slip on through. It's a stumbling block. It's literally offensive to an unbeliever, to the human flesh. It's literally offensive, and it's supposed to be that way. But you see, when you water all that down, uh, telling someone they're imperfect becomes you know, non-PC. It's not politically correct anymore, even in churches, to really you know, hit someone hard with the truth about Jesus Christ and the truth about themselves and how those things vastly differ <laughs> and why we need Him. So half the battle is getting Christians to even agree with such things. And it makes sense, given that <clears throat> contemporary churches water down the gospel. And the question there is why? Because somehow along the way, contemporary thinking has shackled the weak with the perverse notion that we mustn't offend anyone or make them stumble. That's a lie. It may be uncomfortable to make someone stumble, but there's nowhere in the Bible that says we shouldn't be uh, stumbling blocks when we carry the gospel. Because the gospel itself is literally meant to make people stumble. Just as a side note, this week's blog is titled Stumbling Blocks. And it deals directly with this topic. Think about it, though. If the gospel isn't offensive, let's just suppose that for a moment. If the gospel isn't offensive, then it isn't a stumbling block to the human flesh. Implying it isn't the true gospel of Jesus Christ. But rather some, let's call it an accommodating little g gospel that is being tolerated. If the gospel you carry, if the gospel you share with others doesn't make their flesh stumble, something's wrong. This is something Paul warns against up here on the board. I'll give you the Amplified, 2 Corinthians 11, 4. For you seem willing to allow it if one comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, 
You tolerate all this beautifully, welcoming the deception. Welcoming the deception. Hence, the Spirit's exhortation as of late. Go to Ephesians 5.13. Ephesians 5.13. We only go this way once. Last time I checked. We don't spend a whole lot of time on earth, relatively speaking. Um, We represent Jesus Christ. He says, I want you to have my joy. I want you to have my joy. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, right? Why do you have to go to the cross? You know why? Because he was a stumbling block. You're going to get, you're going to have to carry your own cross in this world. He said a lot of things that lead us to this same conclusion. A prophet's not without without honor except in his own hometown. His own family didn't even believe him at first. What was he supposed to do? Smooth it over, get some wax? Wax poetic? What was he supposed to do? That was his family, right? Can't offend your family, right? Wrong, wrong, wrong. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever say that. Ephesians 5.13 But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light, for everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. What? Making the most of your time, because the days are evil. Now, that has a very broad stroke to it, doesn't it? Making the most of your time. And it's so broad, actually, that it's inescapable. (laughs) You might say, oh, crap. That means that thing I did today that was a total waste of time, filled with sinful thoughts, sinful goings-on, that was not, apparently, making the most of my time. (laughs) Oh, that's that's why lawyers and people that like to lawyer in the flesh like very specific statements a lot because they can find loopholes around it. But he didn't say, sounds just like Satan, doesn't it? Did he say? So I like that there are these broad strokes as well as individual uh, strokes in the Bible because it makes things inescapable. You have to do a mighty big job of lying to yourself to say that when you're doing something that's wrong and you know it, that you're making the most of your time, because you're not. Hmm. Here's where we ended on Sunday. Purpose. Making the most of your time means you have a purpose. And purpose gives direction. Given that the Lord has revealed real purpose for us, the point is that we don't misappropriate our lives once saved that we don't misappropriate our lives once saved. In other words, he's given us a clear direction. He said, here's my purpose for your life. Go. If you wander off this path, you're wandering away from my will for you, which is, in other words, a misappropriation of your time and your energy. I purchased you. You're my slave. It'd be like someone purchasing a slave, right, in the heyday, and the slave's like, you know what? I don't know, I need at least 16 smoke breaks a day. So, you know, without the permission of of the master, they just go hang out under an oak tree. While the other non-smokers continue to work. That sounds like some jobs, doesn't it? (laughs) Oops. Anyways, not to ruffle any feathers. But you know what I'm saying, right? That would be like someone misappropriating time for something evil, for something outside of the will of their master. Galatians 5.13, For you are called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. What I, what I like about life itself is that we're on a, you know, we're on sort of, sort of kind of an honor system. Right? You walk out your door in the morning, 
God's like, hey, this is, this is my will for you. You can choose, but you know my will for you. It's like taxes, right? You know, you know you're supposed to pay, you know, what's due Caesar. You know you're supposed to pay taxes. But it's an honest system. And a lot of people cheat and steal and do all this thing because nobody's really keeping tabs. As long as you fly under the radar type thing, right? That's the same thing. God doesn't necessarily beat you up. If you walk his front door and you know his will is for you to turn right and you turn left, does, he, does a big hand come down and slap you into turning right? No, he lets you go. So it's, we're kind of on a bit of an honor system, aren't we? But isn't that the greatest part of love that I want to love you? That I want to obey you? That I want to serve and worship you? Isn't that what God is really after? Isn't God after our heart? Does he want a bunch of just, you know, disgruntled uh, slaves? Or does he want slaves that rejoice in doing the master's will? You know the answer to that. He says, so I set you free. I gave you a free will. Do not use that for your flesh. But do this instead. I want your joy to be made complete. I want you to be like me. Because you don't have my joy. This I know. And what did he do? What was our prototype? He served. He came to serve. He laid down his life. Isn't that what we're reading here? But through love, serve one another. Through love, from within that sphere, serve. And again, when that happens, you're interlocked with other blessings like joy. Oh, and peace is in there, by the way, too. So you get the things that are locked in to divine goodness, like joy and peace. See how it all comes together? So when you do these things, when you don't serve yourself with your freedom, but serve others, Jesus said, now you're being like me. And I'm the author of joy. I'm the author, the originator of peace. See, now you're acting like me. That's all he's saying. So that's where we ended on Sunday. We need to pick up, uh, we need a backpedal. Remember, we're coming out of the mine shaft. Uh, we didn't get a chance to review something from a couple of weeks back. Um, so remember, though, that we are mid-stride in our emergence from a very deep dive on this tremendous series titled The Deceitfulness of Sin. We need to review our walk through some Old Testament scripture from a couple of weeks back now. I think it was uh, on a Tuesday with Scott. Um, keep your mind's eye on the analogy between the Old Testament Israel and the believer's life in the church. Go to Deuteronomy 8, verse 1. Deuteronomy 8, verse 1. And with this perspective that we've been getting about being inside life eternal and all the aspects of what that means in the vantage point and how Jesus spoke, use that perspective now when we read this passage. Deuteronomy 8, verse 1. All the commandments that I am commanding you today, you shall be careful to do. That sounds like obedience, doesn't it? All right, so there we go. We're already in the sphere, right? We're already in there. You see how it works? Not the new under the sun. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Imagine that. He said, I want you to obey. Why? Because I want your joy to be made full. <laughs> so here, I'm going to tell you some more stuff to do. All the commandments that I'm commanding you today shall be, you shall uh, be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to give your forefathers. I'll bless you even. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart. Do you want to obey or are you um, implacable? A lot of you sit and listen to my voice right now or just that. You're implacable. It's why you're miserable. You're implacable. 
And God likes to test that thing in us, doesn't he? He said, oh, you, oh, I see, oh, you're a little miss ungrateful today. You're in a mood because you're a little miss or Mr. Ungrateful today, I see. And a lot of times it just takes a little test, a little pushback. You still going to obey me? You still going to obey me? How about if I take this little thing away from you? And, and you're going to do the wah, wah, like a little kid. And be disgruntled and cross your arms and, and be at odds with the holy God of the universe. <laughs> now you know what's in your heart. Now you know that you're being a phony. Now you know it. He already knew it. But now you do. That's the beauty about being tested. We find the truth about ourselves, don't we? A lot of us like to brag and boast. Oh, I'm a giant. I'm a spiritual giant. And he just goes, oh, yeah? How about that? Where'd all the gratitude go? Where'd the joy and the peace? Where'd everything in the sphere go? I don't want to obey him anymore. I don't even know if I love him right now. I'm not really in love with God right now. I'm having a little tood problem. That's important for us to know. It's important for us. God already knows. It's important for us to know. I've taught you that. Testing is for you to realize the things about yourself. <laughs> God already knows. But it's important that you know so that he can sanctify you. Because if you don't know, you're going to run on false data. Right? And you're going to keep on going as is, status quo, thinking you're you know, a little hot tamale. And you're really just, I don't know, what? You fill in the blanks. You know yourself better than I do. So anyways, that he might humble you, so I'm going to grace you out. But then I'm going to test you to know what's in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Right? God already knew this testing was to prove to his people what they otherwise wouldn't accept as truth about themselves. Sound familiar? Verse 3, he humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not uh, wear you out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. Thus you ought to know in your heart that the Lord your God was disciplining you just as a man disciplines his son. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. As we've learned over the years, discipline is the forerunner to deliverance. Verse 7, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs, flowing forth in valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive and olive oil and honey, a land where you will eat food without scarcity, in which you will not lack anything, a land whose stones are iron, and out of uh, whose hills you can dig copper. When you have eaten and are satisfied, you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Some of us even forget to thank God in the morning for our blessings, because we're implacable. What have you done for me lately, though? There's real joy and peace in thanking God for what you do have. A lot of times, that's the precursor to anything more advanced. If you keep getting stuck back here, <laughs> how's he going to advance you? How are you going to find greater joy if you can't even enjoy and be grateful for what you have today? If you can't handle this, how are you going to handle more? If you're implacable now, how great will your implacability be if he gives you more? But yet, that's what we pray for in our ridiculousness. I know I'm implacable, but I want more. So these are the lessons we see, even in Old Testament. Do not forget where you came from. Something the Apostle often reminds us of, or the Apostle Paul anyways. Go to uh, verse 11. So beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, 
in his ordinances and his statutes, which I am commanding you today. Otherwise, when you have eaten and are satisfied and have built good houses and lived in them, when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold multiply and all you have multiplies, then your heart will become proud because you think it's you. You think it's you. Then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. Does that not sound like you? Weren't you in the slave market of sin before you were saved? Have you forgotten? Are you really that implacable? Do you think that, what, you, you somehow climbed out of the pit on your own? You gave God a little help? And any such blessing tied to any of this, even the physical things, like he's describing, land, food, homes, money, all that's from God. I think we forget. In, intellect, that's another big one nowadays. I think people forget. Where the heck did you get your intellect from in the first place? God. Have you forgotten so soon? All these so-called achievements of yours? Where'd you get your physical prowess? Your ability to, I don't know, do this or that? God, have you forgotten? For real? Hmm. It's not a novel subject. Uh, verse 15. He led you through the great and terrible wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thir uh, thirsty ground where there was no water. He brought water for you out of the rock of flint. In the wilderness he fed you manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do good for you in the end. You see that? That's beautiful. He might humble you and test you for you. I just described that about five minutes ago, did I not? That's why he tests you. That's why he decides to humble you with such tests. Because you have to realize what you are. You need to be on, have parity with God, the way God sees you, your life, your behavior, your thinking even. So it's good for you in the end that these things happen. Otherwise, you may say in your heart, my power and the strength of my hand made me this wealth. I mean, that's like the epitome of even the average American Christian. Again, let us not forget where we came from. Verse 18, but you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who is giving you power to make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. It shall come about if you ever forget the Lord your God, and go after other gods, little g, and serve them, and worship them. That sounds like America, by the way. I testify against you today that you will surely perish. God doesn't fool around, in other words. He's a jealous God. We also received some welcome encouragement. Go forward quickly to Deuteronomy 10, verse 12. Again, this is a point of review. Coming out of the mine shaft from a couple of weeks back. Deuteronomy 10, 12. Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and love him? You, okay, what did you just see? What are, the, what are the two things right there? One is obedience, and the second one is what? Love. <laughs> Didn't I just have like a really, really cool looking slide up there earlier? <laughs> And see how like, this, is, this is what I'm saying. This is like not novel. It's the same God. It's just different. What you, if you want to call them dispensations, that's cool. If you want to call them economies, that's cool. Administrations, that's cool too. I mean, there are variants of administration in your life and mine. I have a spiritual gift that's different than yours. So he treats me different. I have a, a huge uh, burden on me in Holy Scripture. So, of course, I get treated different. Does that mean it's a different God? No. He just treats me different. He has other ordinances on me. So what does the Lord your God require from you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and love him, all in that same sphere, to serve the Lord your God, and other services in there as well, your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which I am commanding you today for your good. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven in the highest heavens, the earth and all that is in it. Yet on your fathers did the Lord set his affection to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, even you above all peoples as it is this day. So circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no longer. 
Okay, so just stepping back now, what's the lesson from the Old Testament dealings with Israel? As I stated at the outset of this little journey back in time, God's the same. God is immutable, which means that even though times and administrations and economies and what have you have changed, His expectations are the same. Do you realize that? Just because of different economies or different administrations, His expectations are always the same. Love me and obey me. Isn't that what we just studied at the beginning of class? Yeah. Where did we go to find that? New Testament. Love me and obey me. That sounds familiar. That's what we just read over and over in, that, in both of those passages. Obey me and love me because that's what you do in the sphere. And Jesus added to that, expanded on it, and said, I want you to have my joy. Because when you do love and obey, you have my joy because that's how I am. So the key, surrender in humility. That just came up as well. Humility. Surrender in humility. Whatever it takes to go into that sphere, to remain there. Surrender in humility. Some of you need to uncross your arms. Some of you need to stop pouting. Stop being ungrateful. Remember where you came from. Remember how excited you were when you realized you were saved? Do you remember that? Cling to it. Why are you not excited anymore? Shouldn't, in all, in all technicality, the more we learn, shouldn't we become more excited? I do. I'm not saying I always do, but for the most part, that's my favorite thing about life. The more I learn from this, the more I appreciate that he did one thing for me, saved me. That's why the gospel is the centerpiece of the entire book. Because everything we learn goes right back to the gospel and our gratitude for it and our love for him. We love because he first loved us. He showed love. He poured love out on us. Showed us mercy, grace. Saved us for crying out loud. Humiliated himself to die on a cross. Have we forgotten all this? How elated were we? You know, 20, 10, 20, 30, I don't know, two years, whenever you got saved, 50 years ago. Have we forgotten? Probably. That's my job. You see, every so often I got to drive the bus back around. Right? Look, kids, Big Ben. Right? Every so often I come up, you go out, and, oh, time to go back. Hey, look, kids, Big Ben. Look at that. Look at the cross. Do you remember that? You remember, remember, you, remember you were saved? Remember that? Wake up. <laughs> Wake up, sleeper. Surrender in humility and then stay right there so that he can sanctify you when you're low. And by right there, I mean abiding experientially in the sphere of eternal life as emphasized earlier. We are all meant to stay there, which frankly seems to be half the battle if we're to put a finger on it. Nobody wants to stay there. If we can just stay put for a little while, uh, as he might say, be still, relax. You don't have to conquer Rome in the day type thing. You know what's going to happen? You ready? You ready? This is a shocking news. You ready? This is, this is going to... You ready? No extra charge. 50, 50 years from now, most of us are going to be dead. And nobody cares about how good you did your job. Nobody cares. They just want your money. When you die, it's just a bunch of savages that go after your money. It's true. No, it's true. The Bible even talks about that stuff. Work, 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 and then someone else spends it. Nobody cares about how great you are at your stupid job. Big, flippin' deal. Work as under the Lord. Now that's a different story. Work as under the Lord. And maybe, just maybe, we wouldn't be $900 in a hole. Just saying. Work as unto the Lord. Maybe, just maybe, you would find joy in fulfilling a need like that. Maybe you should put it to the test. Like Scott said, come Sunday. Just saying. Why did it get really quiet? 
Talk about money. People, I don't like this subject at all. That's when you stop making fun of my shirt. God, you can laugh. Half the people in here are laughing. See what you thought of Scott? Scott said I look like someone from India. <laughs> Just get the white elephant out. I didn't know they sold Indian clothes at Marshalls for 12 bucks. <laughs> Maybe it's disposable. Relax. It's okay to talk about money. It's okay that you guys are screwing up a little bit on the money front. It's okay that some of you are cheap and need to grow up. It's okay to realize these things, honestly. We've all been there. But maybe now's the time to grow up. <laughs> some of you make a lot of money. <laughs> and your giving hasn't changed at all. Shame on you. Because people are dying and leaving. Do you know what I'm saying? You like these meals? They cost. I know, right? I know. Man, why'd you have to go spoil it? I didn't spoil it. I'm just a teacher. See? That attitude's the same attitude you say. You gave me an F. No, you earned an F. It's your fault. The teacher's fault. You gave me an F. No. You earned an F. You earned those comments. Anyways, we are all meant to stay there, which frankly seems to be half the battle if we're to put a finger on it up here on the board. So perspective, the Spirit keeps building this perspective in us. Perspective on sanctification. We, every part of us, have a purpose, spirit, soul, and body. And that echoes from those few lessons on uh, even physical fitness, just phys uh, fitness and readiness for service, that we have a purpose body, uh, spirit, soul, body, all of us. This is what this is all about. He's trying to sanctify us. If this kind of truth stings, even what I just mentioned, then go ahead and blame your flesh for holding on so tight. Up here on the board. The truth, though, shall make you free. The truth shall make you free. If you don't think I'm teaching the truth, go somewhere else. But if you do think I'm teaching the truth, then listen up, because you, it's your freedom that's at stake. We're not supposed to take that freedom and serve the flesh, are we? We don't work as unto ourselves, are we? Are we supposed to do that thing? So we can go to better restaurants and watch, I don't know, watch the church go in the hole? Is that what we're supposed to do? I don't know. You tell me. But that's the truth of the matter. The truth is unmistakable, unavoidable, immutable. It is also immovable, implying we must be changed, sanctified to accommodate it, not vice versa. Not vice versa. It's, we're the ones that are out of line, right? We're the ones that are disoriented to the holy God of the universe. We're the ones who, federally speaking, ejected ourselves from eternal life, the sphere of eternal life. We're on the outside. God has the market on everything inside. And He's not moving. He's immutable. So we have to move this way. We have to accommodate that truth. We don't ask God like a lot of churches teach nowadays to accommodate us in our ridiculousness. And you know what? As it says in that last point there, the sinful flesh despises this. What I just said, the sinful flesh despises it. Up here on the board, here's some more perspective for you. The motivation behind our enemies, especially the human flesh, is to undermine God's desire to sanctify us. That's why we're on part 55 of the deceitfulness of sin. 55 hours of presentation, way more hours in preparation, and I'm hoping and praying way more hours in decompression. Some of you are like, deacon what? Is that like a new deacon, decompression? Deacon 
The motivation behind our enemies, especially the human flesh, is to undermine God's desire to sanctify us. The truth kills the power of the flesh, namely sin itself. There is no defense. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's the truth if you're saved. Sin does not want you to know that. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin. I read a great story about Augustine from, um, I think it was McDonald had quoted it. It's a good story. And Augustine's a uh, very famous, um, a lot of people call him St. Augustine, but he's from the early church. One day, Augustine was accosted by a woman who had been his mistress before his conversion. When he turned and walked away quickly, she called after him, Augustine, it's me, it's me. Quickening his pace, he called back over his shoulder, yes, I know, but it's no longer me. What he meant was what Paul wrote about in Romans 6.11. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin. He says, I've been made alive in God, in Christ Jesus, to God, in Christ Jesus. I don't want any more, I don't want any more of that. I don't want a part of that. I want, that's dead to me. And I don't want to serve the lusts of my flesh anymore. It's dead to me. Do you understand? And that's a wonderful, it's almost like a parable, isn't it? Yes, I know, but it's no longer me. In the context of this story, sin and its alluring nature are represented by the mistress. The temptation to turn around, especially to someone or something so very intimately familiar to him. Something presumably pleasurable even to his flesh, well, it was surely palpable for him. Hence, he did as Holy Scripture states, fleed from youthful lusts up here on the board. 2 Timothy 2.22, I'll give you the Amplified. Shun, don't be afraid of this, folks. Shun youthful lusts and flee from them. How many times am I going to teach this? Because nothing good comes of it. That is why. Shun youthful lusts and flee from them. And aim at and pursue righteousness. All that is virtuous and good. Right living. Conformity to the will of God in thought, word, and deed. And aim at and pursue faith, love, and peace. You think all those things are in that sphere? Yep. Harmony. Do you think all those things in the sphere are in harmony? Yep. In concord with others. In fellowship with all Christians who call upon the Lord out of a pure heart. I'd be willing to bet that Augustine drew upon that in that moment. He said, I need to get out of here. <laughs> Been there, done that, i got to get out of here. This is not good. I'm dead to this. I don't want to uh, prop it up and give it life in me. So he took off. But as we've learned, and as we're going to come out of the mine shaft, and I'm out of time, sin pursues us, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, it does. So in such moments, in closing, in such moments, a person like Augustine is able to use the defenses of the word of truth to protect him. Romans 6.11 and Ephesians 6, for example, where we put on the full armor. Our enemies will use whatever devices they can to deceive us. And this is what I'll close with. Don't ever be surprised by the angles that our enemies will exploit to gain an advantage. Don't ever be surprised. And with the utmost confidence, I might add that it is people, very often the opposite sex, but nonetheless people that have the lion's share of deception. 
Amen? All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much once again for truth that sets us free. We just ask for your blessings as we take the things we've learned out to a lost and dying world, Father, that needs it so desperately. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Thank you.